Canadian Mennonite University has the honor of being located on Treaty 1, the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OJ Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and is on the traditional homeland of the Métis Nation. We reap the benefits of easy access to clean water from Show Lake 40 First Nation in Treaty 3. In the spirit of equity, diversity, and inclusion in the fields of STEM, we recognize the underrepresentation of Indigenous peoples. We understand the value of Indigenous STEM perspectives and the need for non-Indigenous STEM community to, 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 learn, to commit to learning about Indigenous worldviews. We recognize the need to create an environment where Indigenous students and peoples can succeed in STEM without compromising their own culture and values. As we continue the advances in science, may our ideas grow and be influenced by the traditional teachings of the Earth Mother so that we can practice different and healthier ways of interacting with one another, both human and non-human. Uh, hello, welcome to our scientists and uh, residents event. My name is uh, Nicolas Malagon, and I am an assistant professor here in, in biology. My name is Leah, and I'm a first year science student. And uh, we are very happy, we're very pleased to have mathematician uh, Dr. Francis Sue uh, with us. He's the author and uh, uh, he's an award winning teacher and an author and past president of the Mathematical Association of America. This morning he will share the learnings uh, from a report that he co-authored from the American Science Society, American Mathematical Society on the history of racial discrimination in the mathematical science. Welcome to CMU, it is great to have you here. During the forum today, please feel free to enjoy a light lunch of soup and bread available at the back. Mm -hmm. uh, the topic of this morning is equity, diversity, inclusion in mathematics. And I think we all know that as a biologist uh, or in our careers, math is a little bit scary. And we know that uh, it would be wonderful to understand better math. And uh, one of the most difficult things that we to have more diversity is if we can um, have better ways to teach math, that is, is a big problem. Inclusivity, inclusivity and equity in STEM are important because they allow there to be role models of diverse backgrounds who can push for minority youth to study STEM. This creates opportunities and compels people to have a more open understanding to new and innovative change. Uh, so Dr. Sue will present for about 40 minutes. Uh, then there will be some questions from the audience, and we will close at uh, 12.30. Uh, Dr. Sue, uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to be here, and uh, I uh, am grateful that you would spend the time. Uh, to help uh, think through some of these very difficult issues in the mathematical sciences. Uh, I want to say, I'm, while I'm here, I'm giving three talks. Uh, they're all very different talks. Tonight's talk is, is going to be uh, aimed uh, more at telling um, uh, personal stories and also um, having us think broadly about what it looks like to have a flourishing uh, relationship, not just with mathematics, but just but with education in general. Um, but today, here, uh, oh, and tomorrow I'm giving a chapel talk, uh, which is, uh, is going to be uh, quite different as well. Uh, but today I want to talk a little bit about uh, an opportunity I had. Um, you heard that I served uh, as president of a, of a major mathematical organization called the Amer Mathematical Association of America. And there's another major mathematical organization for which I am I just finished serving a term as vice president. It's called the American Math Society. And this organization uh, in 2020 uh, did a, a reckoning of its own history of uh, racial discrimination. Uh, and I want to say a little bit about that. And of course, in telling that story, what I'm hoping all, we all do is think a little bit about what it looks like to, um, to change structures so that they are more equitable thinking a little bit about the communities you're going to inhabit. So um, I'm going to uh, have a start by thinking, uh, I want each of you to think a moment about what you're studying, 
And who are the influences that that shaped you, that made, make you, made you think, oh, if, maybe I want to be a doctor. Think about people that influenced you uh, to do that. Uh, and take a moment and just share an influence with a neighbor, a friend, somebody that influenced you to do what you're doing. Okay, here, here's, a, here's another question uh, I'd like us to think about. Uh, why is it important to learn uh, science or mathematics more broadly? You have another minute. Uh, think about this and share with a neighbor some reasons why it's important. All right. All right, thank you very much for participating in that, uh, in that exercise. Just, uh, I asked you to think about this question, and there are, of course, many possible answers to this question, and I'm just going to offer a couple uh, that I, I think are very different answers. And uh, the reason I, I want us to think about this question is how you answer this question actually will shape the way you, you think about um, who should be in, this, uh, in science and mathematics uh, and, why, uh, uh, it, uh, and how you might, if you at some point, uh, influence people to go into this field as a teacher or as a parent or something? Here are two very different answers. One answer is, it'll help me get a good job. That's one potential answer, right? Like, you know, I, people need uh, scientists and engineers and mathematicians in order to, to innovate, uh, but, but it'll, it'll, la it'll land me personally uh, a good job, potentially. Uh, here's another uh, potential answer to the question, to encounter beauty and wonder, and to understand how the world works. These are, these are both important answers to this question, and I would say, yeah, it's true. It'll help you get a good job if you want to go into a STEM career. But um, the, the first answer, uh, I think, uh, has a, uh, a problem in, this, in the sense that it often sets up STEM, going into science and math and, and uh, engineering, as some kind of competition. Right? I'm competing with other people in order to land that position. Now, in some sense, that's probably, that's probably true. Yes, yeah, I'm going to, you know, you, at every job interview, you're competing with someone to get that job. But, you know, if you think a little bit, of, uh, there was a, a report uh, a few years ago uh, in the U.S. that basically um, a national report that looked at the number of people graduating in STEM and saying, you know what, actually it's not enough, right? In order for the, the, the careers of the 21st century, we actually need a million more graduates in STEM o over the next, you know, 10 years, right? Like, so in some sense that narrative, you're competing with other people, is, is uh, I think, uh, a uh, impoverished view of what it, uh, of uh, 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 answer to that question. Right? Like, we actually need lots of STEM people. So if you want to take this view, it's probably not true that, that um, this is a zero-sum game when it comes to thinking about science and mathematics. But I, that's why I don't like this framing, to land a good job. I think it's much more uh, richer framing to think about the ways that science and mathematics help you live your life better, have a richer view of the world, how things work, to wake up and look at God's creation and say, whoa, this is amazing, it's wonderful. It's a, it, just reflecting a little bit about this, the snow here. I mean, I live in California, right? And I've never been in minus 20 degree weather, <laughs> right? And like, we were just talking about this in chemistry class a minute ago, like this, the, the, the snow is crunchier here at minus 20 degrees than it is at minus two. Why? That's the kind of wonder you might have when you look at the world a different way, because of your college education, whatever it might be. Uh, and this framing, I think, helps us have a, a maybe more uh, a proper perspective about why we're learning and why it's important for everyone to have that view, right? So, for instance, uh, if you want to talk about uh, 
about this view, well, we all deserve, every human being deserves to have experiences of beauty and wonder. Would you agree with that? We should all have the possibility of experiencing that beauty and wonder. And so, you know, from this perspective, I think equity, diversity, and inclusion are uh, important uh, because they reflect, they're an expression of human flourishing. To give people opportunities to experience this joy and wonder, to give everyone that opportunity, um, to see a diversity of people in uh, doing mathematics and science, to feel included when you're in spaces that are scientific or mathematical, is, is important because we're all human beings. We're all made, I'm speaking to a Christian audience here, we're all made in the image of God. And so, from that point of view, this, uh, this view of justice is grounded in the dignity of human persons, ultimately. That's why, that's why it's important. That's why it should matter. And it's part of why I, I ask this question, who influenced you to do what you're doing? I think for many of us, you think of somebody that is like you in some way, right? Maybe, you know, I, I'm a college professor, probably partly because my father was a college professor, right? And I, I understood what that life was about, right? That's very different than going into a field where you have no role models, you have nobody who looks like you doing the thing that you're interested in pursuing. Uh, and it can be a very lonely, isolating experience, right? And uh, as Christians, we should all be uh, part of what it means to welcome people, right? Part of our call, calling uh, as Christians is to welcome uh, the stranger. So, uh, and so what I want to say a little bit about is just a story in my own profession, which is the mathematical sciences. I'll tell you a little bit about what we know uh, uh, has taken place. Uh, but I want you to think about your own future community, whatever that might be, right? What does it look like to be welcoming and inclusive? So in my own profession, which is a group of mathematicians, most of us are college math professors. Many are, are members of one or two of these two major organizations in the US, that's the case, either the Mathematical Association of America or the American Math Society. Uh, in Canada, I think there's one major mathematical organization, the Canadian Math Society. Um, but you know, what, here's a, just a little slice of this, uh, of this what it looks like. So. Um, uh, the, the math profession is still overwhelmingly male, although it's changed quite a bit since, let's say, the 1970s when there were very few women, to now it's about 20 to 30 percent women in mathematics, math professors, for instance, okay? Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm saying this because you can see there's a big difference between tenured professors who have been around generally six years or more and those that are uh, untenured. You can see that as soon as you include untenured uh, faculty, there's now like 30% women, right? You see a lot of women are in that upcoming cohort. So there's been a lot of change just in, in a six-year time frame uh, over uh, how many people are entering the profession of being a math professor. Uh, just another little uh, way to, to look at this data is just, just to look at the number of black Americans, uh, African Americans, who are in uh, this, this pool. Um, in the U.S., it's about 12% uh, African Americans in the general population. Only 1% in the mathematical sciences, right? So that's a very, very small slice. It's a narrow sliver. So now just picture yourself. Uh, if you are in a field where nobody looks like you, how isolating that can be, right? Think a little bit about... Um, if you didn't have mentors or role models? Like why, why, like, why would you go into it? Like, why would somebody be a college professor? Like, I was fortunate to have a college professor as a dad, right? So now I'm like, oh, okay, I can see myself in that. Um, here's another uh, interesting statistic. Um, about a third of all college students enter college wanting to do some kind of STEM. And it's actually very similar statistics across all demographics, where you're talking about male, female, whether you're talking about blacks, Asians, whites, right? And uh, somewhere along the way, many students uh, decide STEM isn't for them. And there may be some good reasons, right? They just get passionate about something else. 
But there are also negative reasons, right? Some of the negative reasons might be um, that it, they feel that it's, you know, too hard, or maybe they feel like they're being discouraged away from doing it, right? And you can see here that uh, for uh, white and Asian students, it's basically half of all people who think they want to do STEM when they enter college never complete a degree in it. Uh, but for underrepresented groups in mathematics who face more obstacles uh, in, in many ways, it's half that, it's 25%, right? So you can see the effect that um, uh, whatever effect is happening to students discouraging them away from STEM, it actually has more pronounced effects on marginalized people, okay? And then, of course, you can th think of a number of different ways where that's true across various issues or questions in society, right? Climate change. For instance, big issue in our, in our current s society has more greater effects on marginalized people. Right? That's another example. So these are all things that, just a, a way of thinking about what's happening here, small number of statistics. So um, uh, one of the things, of course, that, that uh, happened uh, recently in 2020, just after the pandemic, is the murder of George Floyd uh, in the US, uh, an African-American man uh, at the hands of police officers. Uh, and of course, there was a big up, uh, outcry, an uproar at the time uh, across society, but also within the mathematics profession, saying, whoa, we need to have a reckoning. We need to think a little bit about ways that our profession has not been uh, welcoming uh, to people who are at the, at the margins. And, uh, and so one of the things that the American Math Society did it, uh, started thinking about, and I just become vice president of that organization at the time, uh, is thinking about what is our history of racial discrimination in the American Math Society. Now, um, picture this. Uh, when you ask a hard question like that, what are some of the potential responses you might expect? They think, think about this. It doesn't have to be in math. It could be whatever it is. When you say, like, let's reckon with our past history. Maybe you've had some of those discussions here when you've talked a little bit about the Native peoples. And you know, I heard this wonderful uh, introduction here where you recognize the land belonged to, to the indigenous peoples here. And, and you know, of course, there are many kinds of questions, potential objections people might have to reckoning with our past history. Think about what some of those might be. Those are some of the, 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 the challenges, right? The challenges that we face, right? So some, one, of the, one of the potential questions was, well, what's in the past is past, right? Like, why dredge up all this information? It's in the past. In fact, it wasn't even committed by me, right? And I can see why people, you know, it's an attractive thing to think about. Why dredge up things that happened in the past? Take a moment and wrestle with that question for a minute. Like, why is it important to actually think about a past history of racial discrimination, even if it wasn't personally committed by me? Take a moment and discuss with your neighbor. So let me give you one there are many potential answers to that question, but let me just give you one, which um, I, uh, which I learned about because I read another similar report that was uh, that was um, written in the American Medical Association. So this is a society of doctors that had um, looked uh, into um, racial discrimination. And they wrote a very similar report uh, about racial discrimination in their profession, and they said. Rec basically, I'm going to, uh, to summarize, they basically said reckoning with our past and apologizing for our past is important because it reflects our current moral orientation. It reflects the way that we want to, to move going forward. And we have to reckon with some of these past injustices uh, for, for that reason, because we want to show that we, that we uh, are how we're more currently morally oriented. 
So uh, I want to say a little bit about some of the things that we uh, did in this report, what we found, uh, and then talk about challenges and opportunities and open up uh, discussion. So um, the, uh, the charge to our task force, there was a group of uh, uh, seven of us uh, on this task force, um, was to do the following. The first is to help the math community understand the historical role of the, the professional society uh, in uh, racial discrimination. And the second was to consider and recommend actions. What are we going to do about it, basically, that address the impact of discrimination to the council and the board of trustees, which is the governing body of the American Math Society? So you can think of the American Math Society, this governing body, as basically, you know, a lot of what we do is we uh, run events, like having meetings where big, you know, 6,000 uh, mathematicians come together. We also um, publish journals. So these are publishing, you know, the research that's going on. Uh, and uh, we also uh, have um, established policies that universities look to when they're trying to make you know, decisions about things. They say, oh, here's what the American Math Society recommends. Right? These are some of the things that we do. And so what, do you th what are we going to do about this? Um, uh, what can we help uh, the society think about? These were the two pieces of our charge. Okay? And notice, to support these goals, the task force is going to gather information, uh, and advise the council on how to accept responsibility for the actions of our society. Okay, so there's the, there's the, uh, the charge that we were given. And so this was June, basically June 2020. We, um, this is a group of us, uh, seven of us uh, on this task force, uh, all mathematicians, um, two staff workers from uh, from the American Math Society helped us with, um, you know, locating resources and documents and things like that. And uh, many of the, the people on this task force were leaders in the society. And, uh, and so um, it was a somber task. Um, part of what we did was we, we decided we would focus on uh, just, uh, just because we had a time frame and a limit, we focused on the experience mainly of black mathematicians. Okay. Um, we decided to focus on policies, practices, and actions by the AMS. We're more concerned with the impact of these practices than the intent behind, because, you know, people can have good intentions and yet policies can still be bad. Um, we interviewed lots of mathematicians, staff at the American Math Society, and historians of mathematics. Uh, we reviewed, basically, um, Eight, uh, 70 years of uh, council and committee minutes, historical records, wherever we had them. This was during the pandemic, so basically we were limited. We couldn't go into libraries, uh, but we uh, could find a lot of resources online. We also sent out questionnaires um, to the community uh, and had a website where people could offer some pointers or tips. So here's some of the things we started with. So one of the questions we asked is, is this a current is this a current thing that we care about? Like, the, do, do, what do the leaders think? What does the current generation of mathematics think about um, these issues? Is racism a problem? So one of the first findings we discovered is that racism is viewed as a problem both by leaders and by the, the new generation of mathematicians. When I say leaders, I mean the 30 or so people who are in governance, board of trustees or council, okay? And we wanted to know, actually, how many of our leaders actually believe this is a problem. And the other question we asked was, what about mathematicians? Now, we didn't have ready access to 30,000 mathematicians in the US, but we did have access to a source of junior professors who are all new in the profession. Uh, that was about 1,500 uh, mathematicians, and we sent out a survey to them. Uh, the junior professors basically said that um, 75% uh, of those respondents said that racism is a concern and that 86% of them said that AMS has a role in addressing it. Among leadership, similar uh, answers, about 80% said um, it's a problem, 91% said the American Math Society has a role in doing something about it. Now, you know, one, in one sense this is heartening, this is good. Leadership is, thinks this is a problem, so you know, if we write a report, maybe we'll actually get something done. But the other question we asked was, wait a minute, why hasn't anything changed? If so many people think this is a problem, how come things don't change? 
Take a, take a moment to think about that. Why doesn't, don't things change when you, even though people think it's a problem? Um, here's some other things that uh, we uh, found in, in our findings. So um, another was that the, because of blatant discrimination, basically, if you think a little bit about it, um, even explicit instances of racial discrimination that you, you find 50 or 60, 70 years ago have an impact on what's happening today, right? If you imagine you know, a community being unwelcoming, let's say, to black people in the 1940s, many of those people who otherwise would have been mathematicians aren't mathematicians. And so the next generation of people in the, in the 80s and 90s uh, are people who might be mathematicians aren't mathematicians because of the discrimination that was suffered even, uh, even 80 years ago. Right? So they continue to have rep rep repercussions in the development of black mathematicians, the visibility and the perceptions of their work, and the lack of recognition that, that further hinders their professional advancement. Um, we saw many, many instances of explicit dis discrimination in AMS, but also places where the AMS refused or decided not to take opportunities to help mathematicians of, uh, of color. Um, we also tried to help explain through interviews the current uh, struggles that African Americans face in mathematics today. And it might not feel like explicit blatant discrimination. Like in the 40s it was, they weren't allowed at the conference hotels. 40s and 50s. Even after the American Math Society passed a non-discrimination clause in 1951, the AMS was still not welcoming black mathematicians at meetings because they couldn't stay in the conference hotel. That's kind of uh, amazing and shocking. We had a policy. Um, the other thing that's kind of amazing is the work that HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, are doing in, uh, in uh, training the next generation of, of mathematicians, uh, black mathematicians. And then we talked a little bit about some of the, the recent efforts of AMS uh, in addressing these things. And we made lots of recommendations, and I won't go through these, but I just want to point out that some of them are structural, right? We said, okay, we should have uh, basically high-level positions both on the elected side and on the governance, on the staff side, uh, in order to address these issues. We should reform election procedures, right? Can you imagine? We had. Uh, a procedure for electing leaders to the society that didn't actually ask about explicitly about leadership experience, right? It was all about the number of papers you, you published, right? Well, people who publish math papers aren't necessarily the same as people who are actually going to be good leaders. So um, one of the things we did is recommend changes to election procedures and appointment procedures. And then there, of course, there's some program-related recommendations about supporting uh, uh, mathematicians of color in various ways and publicizing their work. That's another big piece. Uh, and then um, one of the things I thought was really important was uh, having accountability-related recommendations. We asked the AMS to provide annual updates on the status of the things that were going on. And to accept responsibility in the form of an apology. Now, um, one of the reasons we thought this was important was we discovered, as we were doing this work, that in 1996, 25 years ago, there was a similar task force that did a similar thing, made recommendations, and guess what? Nothing, not much happened, <laughs> right? And so we didn't want our recommendations to just fall by the wayside. So we recommended and the board, uh, the council later implemented a way of keeping track of what's going on with these recommendations. Are we doing something about it? Okay, so these are some of the things that happened. Um, and I'll just say a little bit, I'll just give you some little snapshots of things that are in the report. So we started off the report by telling a personal story. This is the story of William Clater, who is the third uh, African American uh, in the US to receive a mathematics PhD. His first paper was published in the Annals of Mathematics, you know, which is, as people know, one of the top journals in mathematics. He had trouble getting a job. And not only that, but we, we tell this story, although it's not on the slide here, 
where um, he, he basically, you know, we, there's a letter from his uh, wife after he died basically saying, basically, um, because of the discrimination he faced at meetings, he never liked to go to meetings. My husband never liked to go to meetings. And he, it basically broke his spirit. Right? These experiences, repeated experiences of discrimination, are traumatic. They have personal effects. Uh, they have per there's personal trauma. And even uncovering these stories, when we interviewed current mathematicians, uh, it was a painful process for many of them. Um, here's another example. Um, in the 1950s, um, we, because of the non-discrimination clauses that were passed within the societies um, that you couldn't discriminate at meeting, guess what people started doing? They started having, the, because you couldn't discriminate at social events, basically people stopped having official social events at meetings, at conferences. And instead they had unofficial social events to which black people weren't invited. And so, you know, we actually uncovered several examples of this, but I'll just show you one here. Um, uh, at a certain place in the uh, Alabama Polytechnic Institute, um, they elected not to hold an official banquet, but also not to list any housing facilities that would accommodate people of color. The one black mathematician who attended drove 20 miles each way so he could sleep at home and was told he could technically attend the social hour held in lieu of an official blanket, but, quote, would probably not want to do so. Right, that's the message he got. Yeah, you could come, but probably you wouldn't want to come. Um, lots of examples like this, but this is just a, just a snapshot of the kinds of things that are happening. Now, of course, you might be saying, well, gosh, you know, that, I'm sure that doesn't happen today. Um, so uh, we have a whole chapter where we look at the experiences of at black mathematicians at professional conferences, right? This doesn't, have to, this doesn't just happen in math. It could happen in your own field, whatever your profession is, right? Um, and so, you know, they talk about, for instance, many black mathematicians are mistaken for the, uh, the service help at the hotels. Or they're like, oh, you must have wandered into the wrong place. Can it help you find it, you know, get you to the right place? Regular experiences. And of course, maybe some of these people are like, you know, well-meaning, right? And not, you know, they weren't trying to be discriminatory. They're just like, they're, they're just like clueless. But when you receive like a thousand cuts, you know, it can be painful each time you experience them. Um, black colleagues report feeling they feel they get more aggressive questioning than other people do. And I've seen this happen actually, right? Where women, not just black people, but women, people of color, often or get, get way more aggressive questioning, questioning their, their expertise or their results. And, uh, and so here, the, the, uh, one of the, the participants talks about um, the fact that it, the, I hate these conferences. I don't feel like the crowd takes efforts to be inclusive. I take breaks from it because people do explicit things that make me feel uncomfortable. Uh, even my questions get questioned, letting me know it wasn't a good thing to ask. Right? These are the kinds of experiences that marginalized people feel in our professional settings, even today. Okay, so uh, I'll say a little bit of personal reflections, then I'll talk about challenges and opportunities for us to think about as a community in your spaces. Um, so one thing I, I want to point out is that this was emotional work for our interviewees. They were gracious enough to be interviewed to let us hear some of their experiences. And so I think it's important when people do that, that we actually listen. Because it's not going to come out you know, easy, easily. And it, it's unfair for us to just go up to somebody and say, tell me about your experiences of marginalization. Right? When people talk, let's listen. But let's not place an undue burden on people to talk. Um, the, I think the report has implications for everyone, not just AMS leaders. Uh, a majority, I said this already, majority of leadership views racism as a problem. So why haven't things changed? Why did they not change in 1996? Um, many of the responses we got um, uh, were, to this report were basically, you're, what you're doing is political. Math should stay out of politics. Now, the, the irony is you can look through many examples in, in AMS's history where they waded into political issues that didn't have to do with racism, 
right? For instance, um, support of uh, certain um, uh, uh, refugees from other countries who are doing mathematics. Um, so there's lots of times AMS took positions, and it's only the racist issues that people seem to have a problem with being political. And, and you know, the other thing to think about is we're a society of people, right? Mathematics is made up of people who do it. So you can't avoid getting into um, things that are considered political because they're human issues that affect real people with real careers and real lives. Um, another thing that I think I often ask is whose stories did we not tell, right? What, what stories remain unknown and untold? Okay, here's an amazing statistic. Um, historically, black colleges and universities in the U.S., basically, um, who educate lots of black mathematicians, they make up only 3% of all institutes of higher education. Only 3%. And, yes, they, and, and yet they produce half of all black math majors in the U.S. Think about that. 3% of the institutions produce half of all black math majors. I mean, that says a lot about what HBCUs are doing, but it also says a lot about what other institutions are not doing, doesn't it? That's uh, how, do, how do we learn from what HBCUs are, are, are doing? Um, another thing that I think is an important point to make is that the, even if you think math is all about research, well, the research mission of the university is tied to its success in meeting institutional goals, including the success of women and underrepresented minorities. And then the other thing I thought about was 25 years from now, are people going to look back at our report and like, oh, I didn't even hear about that report. <laughs> like, maybe, I hope some of our report comes to, to fruition in some ways, but what are we going to look back now, 25 years ago uh, now, uh, as a missed opportunity? Um, I will say that um, since the report came out in 2021, the leadership has taken action on many of the recommendations, like certain ref uh, ref uh, election procedures have, have changed. Um, uh, the, the society did not agree to have a, a vice president of, of, of uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion, but at least that was a decision. Maybe that, who knows that, whether the change in the future. Uh, but they have hired uh, an EDI person uh, on staff. Uh, and a lot of the, uh, several of the other things, I think um, there are ways that, 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 that they are um, changing. Okay, so I'm just going to mention some challenges and opportunities. So challenges. Um, one of the challenges, of course, is embedded structures in whatever place or space you're in, like the ways meetings are organized, how people are invited. Um, uh, these are structures that affect people. And if they affect people disproportionately, uh, we should think about them. Practices. There are some embedded practices in, in the ways that we operate in our, any society you belong to. These things uh, need to be questioned and uh, changed. That takes people to do that. Uh, inertia. People don't want to, to, it's just hard. You know, people are busy, and so it's hard to actually to, to do this. But I think it's something that we need sustained attention to. Um, people don't have time to reflect. I think many, most people are well-meaning on these issues. How do we give people opportunities to reflect? And then, of course, another challenge is complacency. Just saying, gosh, you know, maybe one me, little old me, can't do anything about it. But there are opportunities. And so I'm going to just say here, structures, new policies, uh, practices, new norms, uh, being willing to be a leader. Hopefully here, at, you're getting an education that causes you to think about many of these issues and lead on those issues. Um, seeking out allies, people that you don't know necessarily, uh, but who are willing to come along with you in part of this journey. This, I think this, this is important. And then maybe the last thing I'll say about opportunities is listening. What does it mean to listen to people when they have something to say and take their concerns seriously? What does it mean to listen to people who have different views than you on these issues? Right? I think an, in, another important piece is not demonizing people who don't think equity, diversity, and inclusion is an issue, right? Or maybe haven't thought about it enough, right? How do we um, create spaces where we can actually have dialogue on these issues? These are some of the opportunities that I hope we'll all think about in whatever spaces that you uh, inhabit.
Okay, I think I'll quote my comments there and we can have a discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we are going to move into the question section. And there will be two microphones. Please ask any question. We want that everybody participate. Just a reminder that you have to keep short the questions and don't overextend in your opinions. More questions than opinions, okay? And you can text questions, apparently, to somebody who will read them. Yes. Is that you? Oh, I see. Oh yes, here you can send the questions here if you want to send some questions and text them there. By the way, if you have a question, probably someone else in here has the same question. So you're doing them a favor by asking your question. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Just wondering if, um, so this work is done by the American Mathematics Society. Are you aware of, uh, have, have other people in other academic societies taken interest in your work? And are other academic societies doing similar work? Yes. And I'm, I'm interested whether, uh, I'm particularly interested in the sciences. Yes. Uh, but I'm wondering also if you have any reflection on humanities and what the kind of proportions that you gave you know, in your early slides would be there, but there's sort of three questions to yeah. so choose. Thank you. I, I'm a little less familiar with what's going on in the humanities, but I, I, I know of another society. So, there, so there's the, uh, I think is the American Medical Association. Um, we read their uh, apology that they made to um, their society uh, as a model for ours. Um, uh, I also am aware of an excellent report which uh, uh, exists in physics. It's the American Institute of Physics called the Team Up Report. And they actually, unlike us, we focused on research math, which meant a lot of graduate education. They focus on undergraduate, the undergraduate production of, of uh, black physicists. And they went farther than we did in the sense that they actually set goals for their organization. We want to increase the number of black mathematicians, uh, black physicists by you know, a certain percent by 2030 or something like that. Uh, and so they, they set some targets, which I thought was a really bold move. Um, that's the only other one that I'm, I'm mainly aware of. Thank you. In the back? Yeah, question here. Uh, so in your opinion, what is the largest barrier to achieving the commission's goals? The largest barrier to what? Achieving the commission's goals. Achieving the? Commissions is what it says here in the question. I don't know what that means, commissions. The, the goals of your project here. Say that again? Probably the society. Yeah. Oh, the society's goals. What's the largest barriers to these? Um, yeah, good question. Uh, I think one barrier is um, the worry that um, we're not valuing excellence, which, you know, is a little a strange thing. Like, nobody in our group is saying we shouldn't value excellent mathematics, right? And uh, I think another thing is that, like, when you think about, okay, picture this. We have national meetings, right? And you invite a number of speakers to speak at the national meetings. How come they're all white men? That, there's a question, right? Uh, and um, when you invite a lot of people to give talks about their research, like, how are you going to measure whose research is the best, whatever that means, right? And so somehow we ended up with basically mostly white men at these meetings. And over the history of the society, I think we had something like 2,200 invited speakers and only like 14 of them are black, right? Like what? What in the world, right? Like what does it mean to elevate good work? We're, we're not saying invite, speak, invite speakers who haven't done any real math. We're like, just invite speakers who are going to speak about interesting things. There's lots of 
of opportunities there to elevate the, the voices of a diverse group of people doing great work. So that's one obstacle, is, is the perception that math is going to somehow suffer. Um, I think the second, oh, and of course, I think what people are ignoring is when we exclude people from mathematics, we are actually losing talent, right? The more people you bring in, the more opportunities there will be for that next great innovation or mathematical uh, discovery. Um, so anyways, this, that's one uh, obstacle. I think another obstacle is just simply um, uh, complacency, a feeling like, All right, well, you know, little old me can't do very much, uh, even if you think these things are issue. I think there's maybe a lack of awareness, which we hope that our report would actually provide some awareness uh, of uh, how people feel, right? Like, you know, I, some people, uh, after reading the report, said to me, like, they didn't quite understand, like, the, the depth of the hurt that happens at meetings, right? Like, when you're constantly mistaken for the help, right? Like, what? Um, uh, so, uh, I think awareness is another, another, another piece. So those are probably the, the biggest things. I'm, I think for the most part, people are well-meaning, right? Like even the people who are saying math is going to be watered down, what they care about is like, let's make sure that, that, that math is actually, people are doing good work. Yes, we all want that. I think that's the, the hard part is for people to see is that you can get those goals because of diversity and not in spite of it. Hi, I'm John David Pankratz. I'm, uh, I work on an, in an office here in the, on campus. Uh, and I'm reinvigorating my interest in physics that I left high school with but got distracted by, well, things. Uh, and uh, my question is, you've, uh, you'd indicated early on that you decided to focus your work on the African-American experience. And I'm wondering uh, if, you, if, what the, if there's any work being done on the indigenous experience, the Native American experience, uh, in terms of any of the STEM fields. Yeah. Um, uh, our, our work did not uh, cover indigenous peoples, but there are groups of mathematicians who are uh, focusing on indigenous, the uh, experience of indigenous mathematicians. For, I think there's, for instance, a website called Indigenous Mathematicians that is trying to elevate the work of, of the indigenous peoples. Um, that's, that's the main thing that I'm aware of. Yeah, and we chose mainly to focus on, on black mathematicians because of the George Floyd incident, because of the limited time frame, and because it was part of our charge for the, from the president. And another thing we say in the report, which I think uh, is important to point out, is that the experience of marginalized peoples isn't uniform. And uh, so there are some similarities and takeaways we, you, you, we can, uh, uh, you, can, you can take away uh, from the experience of black mathematicians and uh, other uh, underrepresented groups, but not, not everything is going to carry over. So it's important, actually, to, to do that work. about the passing rate of the uh, STAT exam in the US. So, uh, so I got the data here. SAT exam, is that what you're talking about? Exam, yeah. So uh, <laughs> for the uh, Asian students, the passing rate is 85%. Uh, specifically for uh, Chinese students, it's 100%. Uh, yeah. With uh, Korean, and Japanese, and uh, Vietnamese students, it's dropped to 85. And uh, for, uh, black, uh, for uh, white Americans, uh, the rate is 60. For Latino Americans, it's 60. Uh, no, it's 20. And for uh, Black American, uh, African American, it's only 5%. Also, uh, if you see the like the high school uh, inter international high school uh, mathematical uh, Olympic games, so there's all Asian faces for the team America. So uh, how do you explain this reality and? So Tim, my instructor, told us in the first lecture uh, that's that like, there's only one race uh, in the whole world. So, uh, but like, do you believe there's a like, mathematical ability difference between different races?
that's my question. Yeah, great question. Um, uh, uh, yes, I, I believe that mathematical ability is uh, equally distributed among the human population. There's lots of reasons for me to believe that. Uh, one reason is that genetically speaking, we're all like basically made of the same stuff, the same DNA. Um, uh, another reason is, you, is because of some of the variation you see between countries, a lot of that you, it has to do with the culture, with various kinds of um, ways that certain kinds of mathematics is elevated. So for instance, in Asian cultures often, competition math is like a thing. It's important, right? And that's, 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 that's valued. But there's many different ways to be mathematical. So being mathematical isn't just being great at problem-solving competitions. Being mathematical isn't just getting an A in calculus, right? Being mathematical is actually a set of different kinds of virtues, right? Like the ability to visualize, the ability to uh, interpret, to define, to quantify. These kinds of things, these things I like to call virtues, I'll talk more about tonight. These kinds of things are all different ways of being mathematical. And, you know, on an individual level, yes, there are some people who will pick up various kinds of things quicker than others. But it's multidimensional there too, right? Like I might be actually quicker at visualizing than I am at strategizing or interpreting or doing a calculus problem set, right? Like, I might be actually better at this, and I can grow in these areas. Uh, and so, so there's that. I mean, the other thing that you point out is that, and maybe you didn't say this, but if you look at the, 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 um, uh, the uh, achievement of uh, Asians, it's not uniform either, right? There's, you know, Chinese maybe somewhere here, but the, uh, you know, uh, Southeast Asians are generally lower achievement. Now, why is that? Well, I claim it's not because of anything genetic. It's because that often that stratification happens because of opportunities and income. Poverty rates are higher among Southeast Asians than they are for, say, Chinese Americans, right? So, um, I think there's many other explanatory factors that I think are way more important um, than, uh, than uh, race. Uh, hi, my name is Wang Gai, and I have a question as well. So for researchers and for people of black people who have the work and they want to present the work as well, I think sometimes us, the issue is faced in getting into the table and trying that work as well and getting it presented. So how do you remove that barrier and get them to get a chance to you know, share the work and be among the five research pieces that's going to be shared with others? Yes. And the second part of it as well is how also do you allow people of color to collaborate and have the space and opportunities that the rest of the people have? Yes. yes, yeah, that's great. Great questions. Yeah, so one of the things that you're uh, highlighting is the importance of being at the table, whatever that means, right? In, in various communities, it'll look different. At math conferences, it's often um, who, is, uh, who is invited to give a, a major talk, right? Uh, it's also who's on committees, who is uh, invited to leadership, various ways. And so one of the things that at least we tried to do here in our report and made recommendations around appointment procedures, right? One of the, the things is when you're on a, trying to figure out who should be invited, it often matters who's actually on the selection committee. Because if you just have, don't have a diverse selection committee, they're not gonna think of the same, you know, they're not all gonna think of the same people and not think about a, group, a wide group of people. And so one of the most important structural things you can do in any selection committee is to put people on committee, on the committee who are diverse and have a diverse set of different networks. And that means trying to make it diverse in lots of ways, especially uh, racially. Um, uh, and, and, and studies show this, right? You have diverse selection committees, you'll actually have diverse participants. Um, that's probably the biggest structural thing that, that um, you can do. In terms of actually specific ways of helping, there's often programs that aim to lift up underrepresented uh, uh, groups in mathematics and give 
uh, give them opportunities and spaces. So another thing, for instance, you think about is who gets invited to a national meeting often is related to someone having heard someone give a talk. So it's not just on a big scale, it's on a small scale. Like who do you invite to give a talk at your school, right? Oh, that person might end up being on a committee that chooses somebody for a national thing. And so, um, you know, in our local, whatever our local spheres of influence are, uh, it's important to have a diverse group of voices uh, as well. That's something you all can do, right? Thank you. One last question, and then the formal time will end, but people are welcome to stick around. This is a quick one. Are these reports available to the public? If so, where can we find them? Yeah, uh, it's, uh, if you just, if you Google um, AMS, Racial discrimination, that's probably enough to get you the, to the website. That's what I did to find the, the report. Um, or if you Google uh, AMS task force, race, something like that, you'll find, you'll find our report. Uh, if you want to see the one in physics, I think if you Google AIP, American Institute of Physics, uh, team up, T-E-A-M dash up, you can see their report. Thank you. Thanks for having me.